is Germany, Nazi, Hitler, the greatest evil that's ever happened on earth, even though factually and statistically it is not. And part of that learning process for me when I started looking into it was coming across the huge fact that we ethnically, the allies, ethnically cleansed 12 million Germans. Because when you say to people, okay, what is it about Hitler? How, why is he the most evil? Well, the first thing people would say is, well, an ethnic cleansing almost took place. And now I offer it back, you mean like we actually did on innocent people, Candace. Come on, that's the difference. They experimented on twins. I mean, some of the stories, by the way, sound completely absurd. I'm mean, like, the idea that they just like cut a human up and then sewed them back together. Why would you do that? Literally, even if you're the most evil person in the world, that's a tremendous waste of time and supplies. Just slice a person in half and sew them together. That just that just sounds like bizarre propaganda. I was, I was trying to reconcile the Jewish people that I grew up with and who I love and who are my friends and who are my ex-boyfriend, I guess you would say, with this sort of DC Jew who was using these words, not because they believed that what they were hearing was actually anti-Semitism or Jew hating, but to basically silence people. They were threatening people, particular people that I've been talking about, that I'm talking about right now represent a fringe minority of Jewish people that want nothing more than political power. It is just like Black Lives Matter. These people are ultimately Marxists, okay? And when Black Lives Matter was going around calling everybody racist, it was this implicit threat to white people. Do what we say, do what we want, or we will ruin your life. Why else would you refer to someone who is so clearly and evidentially not a Jew hater as one? Because you want power. You want to also make Jewish people paranoid, right? You start using words like the Holocaust is gonna be back. And, and of course, if you're a Jewish person, you hear that, you, you wanna go, oh my gosh, like what is it? What should we be fighting? I want, I, we gotta fight that thing because I don't want another Holocaust. These individuals are evil Marxists. They do underhanded things, underhanded tactics to freak people out and to ultimately cause division, right? Their goal is that they are willing to hurt regular, hardworking Jewish Americans so that they can gain political power. I don't hate Jewish people, I hate bad people. And these people are bad. We all should have the right to weed out bad people in our community. Because on the left and on the right, there are bad people. Yeah, I agree. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned. Um, by elitists that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist. But if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German, everybody to look a different way. That's not to me. That's not nationalism. Um, so. I, and thinking about how we could go bad down the line, I don't really, I don't really have an issue with nationalism. I really don't. I think that it's okay. It's important to retain your your country's identity and to make sure um, that what's happening here, which I think is incredibly worrisome in terms of the just the the decrease in the birth rate that we're seeing um, in the UK, is what you kind of want to avoid. So I'm not. I don't have anything problem. I have no problems with nationalism. It's globalism that I try to avoid. If Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. It's been reported extensively that the reason for her departure was because her comments had been perceived by people at the Daily Wire as anti-Semitic. Again, I'm, I'm not going to comment on this, Pierce. Okay. Rabbi Shmuley, would you comment on him? Because Jeremy has actually commented on Rabbi Shmuley. He said, I've avoided commenting publicly on Rabbi Shmuley because as far as I can tell, the man is an attention whore of the highest order. Is that the general position of the company on Mr. Shmuley? I mean, that, that, that's my personal position for sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, Rabbi Shmuley happens to be a person with whom 
I agree on some matters related to, say, Middle East policy. And uh, I, I also believe that his devotion to camera and notoriety have made him do some untethered things in, in recent days. I mean, the phrase in Hebrew is that's what we would call a chilo Hashem, right? It's a, de- it's a desecration of God's name. And that sort of behavior is, is disgusting in any context. Uh, and uh, frankly, I don't know an Orthodox Jew who feels differently about that, not one. Do you think he should be given airtime anymore, Rabbi Shmuley? I mean, I'm not going to make decisions about who should air him and, and who should not. Uh, what I will say is that the that, that sort of behavior is untethered from reality and, and makes a mockery of much of the, uh, the mission for, for people like me, which includes fighting anti-Semitism. Yeah, but I get a lot of people, actually, after his most recent appearance here, just saying, this guy does not speak for most Jewish people like me. And they, they write in their droves and they say, please stop having someone on the- Well, I mean, that, I mean what he's like doing a, there certainly doesn't speak for literally any Jew that, I can, that I've heard of right. or know. I mean, I can't speak to his positions on Israel again. You know, my positions on Israel speak for my positions on Israel, but that's a different story from dressing up in a Sturmer costume uh, to, to mock anti-Semitism. I think that that's quite you know, counterproductive and, and especially given the, the online discourse pretty, pretty negative in, in pretty much every way I can think of. They're playing people that are actually Jews while at the same time protecting the pedophile elite. They do this over and over again. That's the ADL exists for. They absolutely hate Catholics because Catholics know that this shit has been going on forever, okay? Many moons ago, before they decided to establish Israel as a country, I know you've read like the short version in the classroom and it was like, oh, the Holocaust happened and then we realized that Israel needs to stay. No, that's not how it went down. That's not how it went down at the F all, okay? Catholics and Christians were going missing on Passover, and then they would find bodies, okay, across Europe, and they were able to trace them back to Jews. Blood libel! There weren't Jews, okay? These were Frankists. And so just like Leo Frank killed Mary Fagan on Passover back in 1913 or 1914, I can't remember the exact date, he did it during Passover for a reason, this Frankist cult, which is masquerading behind Jews, still participates in this to this day. Candace Owens has recently faced significant criticism for her videos about Israel. Some people have dismissed her claims outright without trying to refute them, while others have accepted her message without critically evaluating it. My goal is to take a balanced approach by seriously considering her arguments and then offering a response. First, I want to emphasize that it's entirely legitimate to criticize the state of Israel if the criticism is based on truth. Israel, like any other nation, is not beyond reproach. The real question is whether Candace's claims hold up under scrutiny. The same principle applies to Jewish individuals. If someone has done something worthy of criticism, they can be criticized just like anyone else. Criticism alone is not inherently anti-Semitic. It's important to remember that the burden of proof lies with Candace to prove her assertions. If she claims, for example, that unicorns live on Mars, it's her responsibility to provide evidence for that claim, not ours to disprove it. With that in mind, let's dive into her statements and examine them critically. I am so sick of the cowardice, okay? I shouldn't even say it frustrates me. It just downright just makes me realize how much we have lost what it means to be a real man in society. The fact that I am a woman, okay, and I am the person that is saying this, okay, the fact that there are so many conservative commentators who pretend that they're so brave because they're talking about, like, what happened in the latest Trump thing, blah, blah, blah. and then on the topic of pedophilia, they're mum, okay? Like, I, like I, I should not be the only one calling out how many times Zionists defend pedophiles and criminals. This is not normal, okay? Why does Israel allow pedophiles from America to flee and receive protection from their state? Israel, like other countries, has laws in place to protect children from sexual abuse and to prosecute those who commit such crimes. Its legal and judicial systems are designed to address and punish criminal behavior, including pedophilia. However, there have been instances where individuals accused or convicted of sexual offenses have fled to Israel, sometimes using the law of return, which grants Jews the right to immigrate to Israel. 
This can lead to complex legal and diplomatic situations, especially if the individual is wanted for crimes in another country. In such cases, Israel has extradition treaties with many nations and has cooperated with foreign governments to extradite individuals accused of serious crimes, including sexual offenses. The Israeli legal system is generally expected to uphold justice and not protect those who commit crimes, including pedophilia. As with any legal matter, it's crucial to consider the specific legal context and actions taken by both Israeli authorities and the international community in each situation, rather than making sweeping generalization. Why are we, the country that's funding their bullshit, okay, not allowed to extradite our pedophiles? Does anybody have an answer? I don't show hands. Anybody like, oh no, that's totally normal. It makes total sense. Like, can't even asking the question is anti-Semitic. Like, no, guys, this is, there's like a problem here that we can't get our pedophiles back from a nation that we've given billions of dollars to. That doesn't make sense. Why would you want, as a small nation that is the size of New Jersey, okay, why would you want the pedophiles to flee there? As I previously mentioned, the United States has successfully extradited individuals from Israel including those accused of serious crimes such as sexual offenses. However, the process of extradition between the US and Israel can be complex for several reasons. Legal challenges such as disputes over evidence or questions about the applicability of the treaty to a specific case can cause delays. Israel's law of return which grants Jewish people the right to immigrate to Israel and obtain citizenship, can also complicate extradition if the accused person becomes an Israeli citizen. Some countries, including Israel, may be more protective of their own citizens, which can further complicate the extradition process. Nonetheless, Israel has extradited its citizens in cases of citizens, in cases of serious crimes, when legal requirements are met. In some instances, extradition may be challenged on grounds of potential human rights violations, such as concerns that the individual would not receive a fair trial or might face inhumane treatment in the requesting country. These factors can delay or complicate the extradition process, but none of this suggests that the United States is unable to extradite pedophiles from Israel. Like, why would you want the pedophiles to be procreating? Hmm, unless... Unless the nation of Israel may have been established by some Frankists, and it's looking like Theodore Herzl's family was from the exact same area in Moravia and in Bohemia where the Frankist cult was founded. Crazy, crazy when you get into his family that like maybe Theodore Herzl who wrote in a book that he didn't care how many Jews had to die for him to get the state of Israel, like maybe he was not actually a Torah worshiping Jew. Like, I don't know. I'm just throwing out some ideas here. And by throwing out some ideas, I mean, I've read a ton of books and I have figured it out. Okay. Was Israel established by Frankists? I haven't seen any concrete evidence to support this claim. The modern state of Israel was primarily the result of the Zionist movement, which began in the late 19th century. This movement aimed to create a Jewish homeland in response to centuries of persecution, including the horrors of the Holocaust during World War IE, though the movement started long before that. The Frankists were followers of Jacob Frank, an 18th century Jewish leader who claimed to be the reincarnation of the self-proclaimed Messiah Sabadai Zevi. The Frankist movement was a controversial, mystical sect that significantly deviated from mainstream Judaism, advocating for antinomian beliefs and practices. However, the Frankists were a small fringe group with no significant political power or influence on the global stage, let alone on the establishment of Israel. Israel was officially established in 1948, following a United Nations partition plan and a subsequent war of independence. The Zionist movement behind Israel's creation was led by figures such as Theodore Herzl and Chaim Weizmann, who were motivated by the desire for a national homeland for the Jewish people. 
As for the claim that Theodore Herzl was a Frankist, I haven't seen any historical evidence or reason to suggest this. Herzl and Frank did not come from the same region. They lived in different parts of Central and Eastern Europe, even if some of Herzl's ancestors had come from the same area as Jacob Frank. This would be highly circumstantial at best. The suggestion is as tenuous as assuming someone is connected to a serial killer simply because they come from the same town. Furthermore, there is no credible evidence that Herzl ever wrote or expressed indifference to the loss of Jewish lives in the pursuit of a Jewish state. On the contrary, Herzl was deeply concerned about the safety and well-being of the Jewish people, which was a primary motivation for his advocacy for a Jewish state. Claims that he was indifferent to Jewish lives are rooted in misinformation, distortions, or misrepresentations of his work. Candace Owens has claimed to have read many books to support her conclusions, but it's important to remember that books can contain misinformation. It's not enough to simply read. Critical examination of the content is crucial, and it doesn't seem that she has done this effectively. I am just like so over the idea that Israel is our ally. And if another person says that stupid statement, I'm going to personally punch you in the face. I am. It's going to be me. That's a joke. Don't take this video off of Twitter. Wink. But like, it, it, I, I cannot stand the people that sound like bots, the spineless cowards. And I'm calling out all of you men. Everybody was a check mark and also has a penis I, and, and has not said anything about Israel protecting pedophiles or has said the statement like, you know, uh, our friend and ally and but can't justify a statement. I'm talking specifically to you. So if you're sitting there wondering, you're like, hey, I have a check mark and I'm a guy. And I have a penis. And I've never said, I'm talking to you. Yeah, it's definitely you. Like I'm talking directly to you. Okay. So we've got this friend and ally and we're not allowed to ask questions about JFK's shooting or the USS Liberty. Yeah. There doesn't appear to be any credible evidence supporting the claim that Israel was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. The assassination of Jeff Kin Dallas, Texas, on November 22, 1963, has been extensively investigated, with the official investigation by the Warren Commission concluding that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. There is no substantive evidence linking Israel or any other foreign government to the assassination. Claims involving Israel's involvement are generally speculative and lack support from historical documentation or critical research. Therefore, it is up to Candace Owens to provide credible evidence for her assertions rather than merely making claims. Regarding the US liberty, Israel was indeed involved in its attack. On June 8, 1967, during the Six-Day War between Israel and its neighboring Arab states, Israeli forces attacked the U.S. Liberty, a U.S. Navy intelligence ship. The attack resulted in the deaths of 34 American sailors and injuries to many others. This incident has been a subject of controversy and debate. Israel has consistently maintained that the attack was a tragic case of mistaken identity, believing the U.S. Liberty was an enemy ship amidst the intense and chaotic military operations during the war. After realizing the mistake, Israel quickly apologized and paid compensation to the families of the victims and to the U.S. government. Multiple investigations conducted by the U.S. government, including inquiries by the U.S., government, including inquiries by the U.S., Navy and the National Security Agency, have generally supported Israel's explanation, concluding that the attack was unintentional and the result of confusion and misidentification. Mm -hmm. The Mossad there on the day that JFK was shot, the arguments that he was having in the days preceding with their prime minister, still classified. Okay, we'll never know what they were arguing about. And then Jacob Rubenstein shoots the guy who said he didn't shoot the guy. Do you have a question about that? You might some might. Don't come at me. Don't even like, I don't even want to hear questions. Did Jeff have arguments with the prime minister of Israel in the days before his assassination? 
Yes, there were tensions between the United States and various international leaders, including those from Israel, in the days leading up to President John F. Kennedy's assassination. One notable instance involved a diplomatic dispute between Jeff and Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion regarding Israel's nuclear ambitions. However, this does not necessarily imply that Israel was involved in the assassination. At best, this is weak circumstantial evidence, and much more would be needed to establish any connection between this dispute and Jeffska's assassination. As for the claim that the Mossad, Israel's national intelligence agency, was present at the JFK assassination, there is no credible support for this. The assassination on November 22, 1963, has been extensively investigated by U.S. authorities, including the Warren Commission and various other inquiries, all of which concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Therefore, if someone is going to claim that Mossad was involved, they need to provide credible evidence. Similarly, the claim that Jack Leon Ruby, the man who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, acted on behalf of Israel lacks evidence. Candace Owens has not presented any evidence that Jack Ruby acted on behalf of Israel or any other foreign entity to assassinate Oswald. While it's understandable that not all evidence can be presented in a single video, she hasn't sufficiently backed up her claims here or elsewhere, to my knowledge. As a result, these claims must be dismissed as mere speculation without concrete evidence. However, if she does have credible evidence, it would certainly be worth examining. We're not allowed to ask about, even speak about the USS Liberty. The fact that, like, after October 7th, they jammed through a bill in Congress, okay? And they were like, we must have an October 7th day of remembrance in school. Kids must learn about this in school. And we can't get one for the USS Liberty. Okay, that means your nation is being held hostage by a foreign power. That simply doesn't logically follow. It's a complete non sequitur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of that Jacob Frank religion, the reason why um, they wanted to commit the act of pedophilia was because he believed that like, if you were willing to commit that sin, you would do anything else. His theory was, I'm going to, like Jacob's Ladder, bring you to the bottom, to the abyss, get you to do the most immoral things, only lift you back up. And it immediately creates camaraderie among the group of pedophiles because all of them have done this horrific thing. So basically they're like, in order to like become, get into this religion, you have to rape a child, okay? Some accounts suggest that the Frankists included sexually permissive rituals intended to symbolize the breaking of religious and moral boundaries. However, the more extreme claims, such as the idea that followers were required to commit acts like rape, are not substantiated by credible historical evidence. These claims are likely the result of later exaggerations or misinterpretations of the movement's practices. And so you have people that are willing to do that OK, that are in this religion, a religion who the first Jewish Supreme Court justice, look this up, Louis Brandis, was a Frankist on his profile. He kept a photo of Jacob Frank's daughter like he was an open Frankist, open Frankist family that has made it to the Supreme Court. But I, I, I guess we can't ask any questions. I certainly believe that people can ask questions. However, I wasn't able to find the photo in question. That's not to say it doesn't exist, but I simply couldn't locate it. Even if it does exist, having a photo of someone's daughter doesn't automatically mean he was a Frankist. There could be other reasons for the connection. This is just another non sequitur. These people that are committing crimes are also Zionists. And it would be cool if, like, I'd be in a different place, by the way, about this. Every religion has people that are corrupt and immoral, right? But we don't defend them. We don't expect them to be defended by the press. We don't have an entire ecosystem. And he believed in homosexuality and of and incest, all this stuff, who's protecting those people who are still, their descendants are still in positions of power. That is what makes this unique. So no, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be like all of the other 
fake conservatives. Like, oh, I'm just I'm so brave. I'm talking about this issue. But on pedophilia, I'm just going to be like, mm, not my hill. If that's not your hill, we don't effing need you in this country. We don't need you in this country. Do you think it's normal, by the way, that basically every person who speaks about Israel has to basically say a statement that's like, you know, I don't want to get killed? I don't believe that's true. I don't think you actually need to make that qualification. <laughs> like, like, literally, you start speaking about people are like, Candace, beef up your security. That's not normal. Like, excuse my language. But, like, that is not normal, okay? It's not normal that people have to think about their security. Because, and by the way, so normal that then the way that you get comfortable with it is you're like, ah, eh, well, you know. They shot JFK in an open car, so there's not, I mean, he's a sitting president. I mean, obviously, my security doesn't really matter. If they want me, they're going to get me. That's not a normal thought process to have. I certainly agree that it's not a normal thought process to have, but that might be a sign of the underlying problem. It's not normal. We don't have that about any other country in the world except for the one that, you know, took over ours, and that's the truth, okay? We are an occupied nation, and if it's going to take women like having to speak up and say that to make permission, like to give permission to men to do the same, then I'm happy to be the first person. Okay. I just want to be clear. Anything happens to me, blame the Zionists, like 1000% blame the Zionists. Like, like <laughs> let that be my, my parting words. Okay. The more you look into their little network of psychopaths, they all collude each other. Just so you know, the Zionists on the right are the same as the Zionists on the left. And it should be an easy litmus test for you guys. Like, Speak to any commentator if they are not willing to condemn Israel. If they say they're our friend and ally and you ask a question about their defense of pedophiles, about Louis Brandis, about all of these Zionists, Anna Freud, the Sigmund Freud family, they have like a Tel Aviv University whole thing dedicated to them. If they're unwilling to say that, just don't support them. It's that easy. I'm not, I'm not going to become the person. Like Andrew Tate said something that really stuck with me. He was just like, you know, at the end of the day, they're just going to rape your kids last. Like you're either going to be a person who dies on the hill for something that you believe in, or you're going to be the person that sits around and you do nothing until it, it the snake wraps around you and squeezes out your family last. I mean, that's the truth. That's quite an either or scenario. It seems there was no third option. That's where we're at right now. And I'm like, I would rather die on the hill. Like I would, I, I just want to be able to pick the hill and die on it. And that hill for me is pedophilia. Look. I admire people who call out pedophilia, especially when it puts their own safety at risk. However, it's crucial that we do so based on truth, not on leaps of logic. All these homosexuals that are engaging in pedophilia, I mean, openly for France, I and mean, what the heck is going on in this world right now? And this is what happens when good men do nothing. We have a bunch of good men. I know these people. I know these men. They do nothing. And they do it because they're scared. Some of those men are personal friends of Candace Owens. But I won't name names. They're scared to lose their jobs. They don't do anything because they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose their security. And they think that by being a man and not saying, it, it's like to not say anything. And I, I just completely disagree with that. So anyways, um... Like I said, if I get killed, it's definitely a Zionist. I guess I'll open up the stage. I mean, some people are requesting, does this work? Who's Matthew? And tag me a bunch of times and be like, oh my God, she's really gone crazy. I'm not kidding. The comment section, I'm going to drop this in the thread after. It was like, she's going through a postpartum psychosis. We're going to get to that too. Like the categorizing of women of having a psychosis because it's kind of actually relevant to what I actually said. So I'm going through this and I write under them, like, why, why would you? And of course, there's no video because when they lie, they, they just lie so boldly. It's like, it, it's just amazing to, to be a person in society that gets to pretend they're being the victim as they're punching you in the face, right? Like, literally, like, I'm punching Candace in the face while I'm screaming out, but I'm the victim. That's Jewish on campus, right? I've noticed some tendencies in Candace Owens' reasoning that are worth considering. She often operates with an either or mentality without acknowledging the possibility of a third option. Additionally, she tends to reach conclusions based on a chain of assumptions where each premise builds on the previous one, even if the initial premises are questionable. This approach reminds me of the show. The show might start by presenting a jar from Baghdad and claiming it was an ancient battery. From there, it asserts that humans couldn't have created it, so it must have been made by aliens. Then, 
It suggests that these batteries were used in alien spacecraft, which were used to bring aliens to Earth to create humans. Ultimately, the jar is presented as proof that aliens created humanity, all based on speculation. Candace seems to reason in a similar way, which can be problematic. To illustrate this, let's apply the same methodology to Candace herself. In a video, Candace's husband is shown in a photo with Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate is accused of trafficking women. So by this logic, Candace Owens must be part of a trafficking ring. Or consider this, Candace is married to George Farmer, a Catholic, and has recently converted to Catholicism. Her husband's father is Lord Michael Farmer, the Christian deputy chair of the Council of Christians and Jews. Therefore, one might absurdly conclude that Candace Owens is a Jewish Zionist plant in the Catholic Church, clearly. These conclusions are ridiculous. In other words, Candace often connects dots that don't actually connect, relying more on speculation than on concrete evidence. This is unfortunate because she has been treated unfairly by people using similar methods to slander her. Yet she employs the very methodology she condemns in others. To be clear, I'm not defending her statements, nor am I defending those who have slandered her. I'm merely pointing out the irony in her approach. If you found this helpful, please hit the like button. Subscribe. Thank. Bye.